Welcome back to episode number 28 of What's New with Mead. Today, I have a very fun guest. This is Vicky Rowe from Got Mead, which is one of the, if not the largest mead forum out there on the interwebs. And um, I'm super excited to talk to her. So Vicky, welcome. Super glad you're here. Oh, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I would love to start off. I'm sure most people who are listening to the show have undoubtedly heard of Got Mead, but for anybody who might not have, can you tell us um, what Got Mead is and what you guys do? Uh, well, Got Mead is the oldest and largest uh, collection of mead information on the internet. And uh, I started it back in the late 80s, early 90s. Pretty much about the same time the inter- about the same time that that website started to happen, got me kind of happened right along with it. Yeah. Um. And it, and it got started kind of as a place for me to collect the information that I was pulling together on how to make me because I decided that I you know wanted to get into it. And of course we didn't have we didn't have Ken Tram's book. We didn't have mm-hmm. um you know we didn't have an internet. You know you could look it up. There was no <laughs> Facebook. There wasn't any of that stuff. So, so you had to find the information where you could get it. And it wasn't like you could go to the library and get Robert Morris or, you know, any of the other books. Uh, they typically didn't have them. So you had to hunt the stuff down. Mm-hmm. And, and so as I found this stuff, which at the time, a lot of it was coming through um, the Society for Creative Anachronism and other groups that kind of did, you know, historical type stuff. So that was where a lot of it was, you know, was coming from at the time. So it just, it started out as a collection of links and um, pretty soon people started finding it. I I set it up because I was also teaching myself HTML at the time. (laughs) Uh, So I was like, I can do this, you know, and and then people started finding it and emailing me and then some people would send me other information or links or, you know, resources or what have you. So I just kept collecting and it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger to where it is today, you know. Yeah. Well, one thing I was, um, I'm really excited to talk about with today is um, your historical uh, perception of the mead community over the years. I guess that's a weird way to say it. But since you've been in this world for so long, you've seen it undoubtedly change and adapt. And as new techniques show up, you know, the old ones get questioned or whatever confirmed. So uh, I want to get into those nitty gritty details in a little bit. (laughs) But, okay. but I do want to ask you um, to share any avenues where people can find your stuff with Got Mead. Um, I know you guys have a podcast. What else do you guys have uh, that people can consume if they're looking for more mead information? Okay. Well, there's obviously, there's gotmead.com, the main website. Part of that is a very large forum that goes back a good 20 years. Mm-hmm. So there is information. If you mine deeply enough, you can go all the way back to the days of pitch, weight, and boil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so it goes back a good way. So you do have to kind of stick with, with, with intention, you know, and, and be thinking about, cause it's not all going to be perfectly good stuff. There's all sorts of people on there and they have different ideas. Um, we have, uh, uh, we have two Facebook groups, the main got Mead group and the got Mead patron group. Mm-hmm. And uh, patron group is available to our paid patrons, which is a thirty dollar a year membership. And, uh, and then the main group is open to anybody just to answer the questions. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's a lot of people in there. Again, their experience ranges from I'm just getting started to I've been doing this for thirty years mm-hmm. or more. So you know, again, you have to just kind of you have to do your own diligence. I'm a big proponent <laughs> of do your homework. Oh that yeah, the knowledge is there to be gained but you have to do it. You can't just sit there and hope that people are going to feed you everything you need. Absolutely. That's not the way it works. Yeah. And I definitely encourage, um, I do a lot of me myth tests and AB testing and stuff. And um, I try to encourage people that no matter my results, like they are not biblical fact, what you're going to, the only way to really understand the results is by doing things yourself. So testing mm-hmm. what D47 yeah. versus bread yeast is like, you know, somebody on the internet just describing it's not going to do it justice for you. You should go do it mm-hmm. yourself. So, oh yeah, totally. It's good to have the content, but it's even more important to do something with the content. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Experimentation does it. I mean, I I started making me back in the days, like I said, when it was pitch weight, and they were still at that point recommending, you know, that you boil. That was what mm-hmm. was available. The information that was available, and you know, I mean, I'm. I've been making mead for going on 30 years now 
And I learn stuff all the time, Mm -hmm. you know, because there are new techniques being developed. There are new things being found that add to the knowledge base of me making that, you know, that, that broaden our horizons and give us other opportunities to make better mead. That doesn't mean that there's like one true only path, you know, and all the rest of you are heathen infidels (laughs) or doing it wrong because that's not the case. There are different ways to skin the cat, but, um, there we're we're finding a lot of uh, best practices, I guess you'd call them. Yeah, there's a lot of. Um, I feel like it's, and you can speak to this too. I think this is kind of good segue for us to get into it. Do you feel like the um, scientific side of mead making has, uh, I guess, with the internet and things, has increased like significantly since you first started? Obviously, you said there's not a lot of book information, but how do you? Um, yeah, I guess there's that. What are some of the main, main techniques that you've seen change from 30 years ago to now? Uh, well, obvious ones, don't boil your honey um, <laughs> no. or, or even heat it, you know, because of the aromatics that are destroyed, you know, when you start messing with the honey. Um, the uh, nutrient, nutrient regimens are probably one of the biggest things It used to be that, you know, you didn't really think about feeding the yeast. It was like you flung the yeast in there and, and you slapped the top on it and then did this for a while until it was yeah. done. <laughs> and um, now, and then it went to, well, get that little packet of yeast nutrient from your brew shop and just throw some of that in there with the yeast that you're just throwing in there. Mm-hmm. And then we went to, no, you really need to make yeast starters, but we're still front loading all the nutrients. Mm-hmm. And oh, by the way, we probably shouldn't just use that yeast nutrient stuff because that's really just dead yeast holes there are better solutions and don't forget about yeast assimilatable uh nitrogen you know and 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 then that took us to graduated uh feeding step feeding or not step feeding graduated uh interval feeding which then led to tosna and you know so so there's been a lot of movement in you know in techniques the the whole right now the big change that we're seeing uh, you know for years it was you need to uh, you need to be introducing oxygen during that first third of the fermentation mm-hmm. when the yeast are really aerobic, and um, now they're saying no, you really don't need to do that. And then you know, and that led the degassing crowd had gotten in there saying, oh yeah, but we've got to degas to get the nitrogen out of you know the CO two out of suspension, and and now they're saying no, we don't need to do that either. So yeah, it's it's so wild to me, and I mean to be a Break with you. I've only been in the community for this is going to be three and a half, almost four years now. Of I would say seriously being in the brewing community, so I'm still so new to it, and I feel like I came in right at those points where you know Fermaid O was kicking in, and that you know that was the big thing, and um, then Fermaid K, and then finding out all of these other mixed uh, techniques and results from things. So like I I was confused going in because just like you said there were stages where people said, do this. And then it turned into, well, don't do this now do this. And it's almost like what was true. And I think the the truth is we're still finding out what's true at this point. Well, and, and I mean, you've got the, you've got the staggered nutrient addition Mm -hmm. people, you know, that prefer that method. Then you've got ones that prefer the Tasna method. Then on, on the third hand, you've got the session mead folks, and, and what they're doing, and if you listen to Got Me Live, you hear our session meet people, Kevin included, since he's our host on the show now, they front load because it's fast, you know, so mm-hmm. you don't have time for that. So I think a lot of it depends on, you know, your, your approach, your environment, uh, what kind of meads you're making, and, you know, what just seems to work best for you. Yeah. But the only thing, but the only thing that I really kind of come down on people about when I see them, like, in my forum or, or, or um in the groups is no, you really do have to feed the yeast. You're starving them Mm -hmm. and you're going to get off flavor. So you have to feed them. Now, how you feed them and how much you feed them, you should, you know, look at the yeast manufacturer's recommendations. You should look at the yeast assimilable nitrogen requirements of that yeast, you know, and then make your decisions thereof, you know, and then go from there. But but yeah, the ones I see were like, wow, I don't put any nutrients in at all. It's like, yeah, I'll bet your meat's not good. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's, uh, I feel like until people start experimenting with nutrients, they don't understand the value of them. If you, they don't if, really see. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I did. And, I mean, uh, some of that comes out of the I don't want to use chemicals. It's like, then don't use honey, don't use water, don't use because those are all made up of chemicals. Uh huh. So, so that to me that that is a it's a really narrow view because you're saying this is a chemical and it's like no, it's nitrogen, which is an element, mm -hmm. and this is something that yeast needs for food, you know, to be healthy. You know, that would be like saying I'm not taking vitamins because chemicals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's a yeast vitamin for all intents and purposes, and and you know, and it's 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 nitrogen, it's dead yeast hulls. So not chemicals, it's actually, mm -hmm. you know, cannibalized yeast, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and a few other things. So it, I, I don't really, I don't really agree with that perspective, although, hey, make mead however makes you happy. But I think that you're going to get an exponentially better mead if you have healthy, reproducing, happy yeast. Absolutely. I, I agree completely. And that means they need food. Yeah. You know. I, and I didn't start with nutrients. That was my one of my things. I, I mean, I guess I, I did. I threw raisins in at the beginning. but <laughs> Yeah, raisins are not nutrients. No. And, and that was one of those myths that unfortunately refuses to be dispelled. Oh, that yeah. Was, I've tried uh, yeah. on my channel. I've tried to do it. I did a big test with it. I've done it. I've done it with whole raisins in a capacity. I just finished a test recently where I chopped them up because somebody was like, well, you didn't chop them up. So they didn't really whatever. And so I did it. And yeah. So, no, I, you get you get a lovely raisin flavor. That's what they're good for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they've done they've done uh, scientific testing on raisins, mm -hmm. and there is not enough yam in raisins in order to feed yeast. Period. End of absolute fact. Yeah, you know, it's 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 not a yeah, but it's a there is not enough <laughs> yam in raisins unless unless you filled about half of one of those mm -hmm. gallon jars behind you then maybe maybe you get <laughs> enough you wouldn't have any meat left you know <laughs> exactly it's just it's it's a silly um silly thing but that's what i fell into when i first started i was throwing raisins in and i was i was told that that was for nutrient and i believed it and that's kind of what, what i went with so i, I want to ask you i know it's not on my list but do you have a favorite yeah, that's cool nutrient you like to use do you have a, a favored one of all the things you've tried um i i wouldn't say i have a favorite i basically i mean i use a lot of alaman yeast but uh fermaid is mm -hmm. you know and i, fermaid I o both. or k do you use yes <laughs> <laughs> okay. i use them both um lately i've been playing with o i hadn't mm -hmm. hadn't really used it a lot before i've been pretty much on k and then o came out and i was like yeah fine i got k i'm okay with that mm -hmm. but um I've been playing with O to, you know, to see. So I, I actually just got a, like a giant bag of it. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I got a half dozen batches I got to do. And you go through a lot faster than you think you, you do. You do, yeah. Well, yeah. And that's, I know it's a newer product. Yeah, newer in that it five or six years ago was its start. Yeah. So it's not really yeah. that new. But um, I definitely, I, I love using those. And I kind of ask that because one, one of my new things I'm trying to do is uh, make kind of like tier list and say like, what's the best honey in my opinion, you know, and have all these different kinds of honeys. And so I did one recently for yeast nutrient and for me, mm -hmm. and K we're up at the top. It's just the oh, yeah, yeah. most consistent. Those are, yeah. They're pretty much what I use. They work. The science is there. Um, you know, they're, they're measurable. Uh -huh. And yeah. So, I mean, I go, I'm a lazy mead maker. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, I mean, I know I've got friends who are science geeks and they're constantly, you know, diving, you know, uh, neck deep into the science and that's great. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to make a nice mead, mm -hmm. you know, so, so I'm going to go with the stuff with established uh, results and, and support that I know works. And I have a lot of friends that are talented mead makers that make amazing mead and this is you know they're using fermate they're using oh they're using k so you know i'm not going to mess with it yeah i think that um for me if i were to be going commercial then i would maybe start obviously looking at finances and i know that some things might be more affordable and that when you get into batches where you're doing 500 gallons maybe it is a little more affordable to do x y or z thing but at this point, I'm making a gallon, three gallon batches. Like I'm okay with yeah. spending an extra two bucks to buy, you know, this one thing to buy Fermaid O instead of just throwing mm -hmm. in some yeast holes. So um, stuff like that, I th definitely think is uh, where people get angry because it's like, well, you're not doing the right thing. Well, the right thing is kind of 
the right thing is make you making good meat, like you said. Right. It's make good meat. Yeah. That you and, like. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yes. Uh, with qualifiers, yes. That you mm -hmm. like is often, hey, it's 22%. Oh, yeah. And it gets me <laughs> drunk, you know, and it's like, um, okay. If yeah. you're happy, that's great. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I mean, yeah. I, I, I like to see people making good meat. Uh huh. You know, and, and it, you know, should, tastes good it should be something that you're proud to share with people who actually know what a good meat tastes like you know yeah no for sure I me think... anyway i mean I, I can't tell you how many meats i've been like i'm not sharing this with my friends who would tell me exactly what they think of it and it's not up to my standards for what i would let them have you know uh -huh. i'm well, my own worst critic <laughs> well and that's the tough part too is we make all this stuff and most of the time when you become the the known brewer of your friends like you become the free alcohol guy. And I think there's a, uh, which is nice because you can give, you can share your stuff with your friends, which is the whole point of mead making is to make it for yourself and then oh, get yeah. other people involved. It's to share. Yeah. But the other side of that is most of the time when people get free booze, sometimes they, uh, they just, it's free booze and they don't really say anything. Otherwise they won't give real critiques. So finding friends who are willing to say, uh, Hey, this was good. Or, Hey, this wasn't good. Uh, is important. It's good to share it, but then also have a it little yeah. panel of people who are trustworthy, who can be brutally honest with you and say, that was terrible. Who will be bad. honest with you, yeah. And that's the thing I tell people when, when they're like, well, my mom and my friends say it's great. And I'm like, well, they're your mom and your friends. Of course they do. <laughs> yeah. My mom and my friends tell me it's great too, but they're not they're not people who, who, well, some of my friends, you know, but like my local friends in that are not necessarily, they're not, um, they don't have developed palates. They um, haven't experienced enough mead to, to know good versus bad, mm -hmm. you know, to be like me judging, um, you know, some grape varietal that I've never had before. Right. You know, or, or, you know, or, or a, a drink that I've never had before. You know, I wouldn't be a good judge of say mezcal. I've never had it. So, you know, how would I do that? So that's what I think people, that's where the competitions can come in, mm -hmm. you know, cause you can get, you, you're getting, you know, nobody knows who you are. So you're getting honest appraisal, which is really um, nice. But yeah, it is. I mean, it hurts when I give a mead to say like Pete and he comes back and says, okay, here's what you did wrong. And here's how you can fix it. <laughs> yeah. You know, but it's good too, because then I learn and, and my next mead is better, mm -hmm. you know? So, That's the most so important is, thing. it's a good thing. Yeah. I don't have want to only up. praise. Yeah. I don't want only praise. I want people to tell me what they think. Oh, absolutely. And I, it, you're right. It does hurt. Even, even if you know that it's got something wrong still to hear it, but it's, it's about learning. And if, if you mm -hmm. are making a batch of mead, um, I try to, I do a lot of recipes for one, but when I find one that's decently, the one that I want to evolve and I want to really transform into the perfect thing, I'll end up going through four or five iterations of it before I get to the point where I'm like, okay, Hey, I'm getting there. And that's just like, yeah. trial and, error. and I think that's important. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, no question about it. I mean, I've seen lots of people that do the same, that do the same recipe multiple times because they're dialing it in, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're, they're getting it right where they want it to be. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it's, it's super important. Any mead maker grow by sharing and grow by, uh, <laughs> negative feedback sometimes. So I want to switch over now and talk about some uh, mead myths. One of my big things I love about mead making that I didn't know I was going to love is the myth side and the scientific testing and the what happens when. I know that you have seen a lot of these myths um, like raisins put to the test and you, you know, they've been debunked or confirmed or whatever else. Are there any myths in the community that you have heard about that you want to see tested that maybe haven't been tested? Huh. I know that's a weird, that's an interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's problem is, is that that kind of goes to the, uh, there's one true way to, um, you know, to make a good mead. And mm -hmm. that's really not the case because there's yeah. so many variations depending on what you're doing and, and so forth. But, um, the whole, um, the whole chemical thing, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it, it, it frustrates me because I feel like people aren't getting their, 
they aren't getting their own best efforts because they're adhering to something that's really not the case. And you mean, are you, you talking know? about sorbate and like metabisulfite specifically or like just chemicals in general? Well, nutrients and, 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 and sorbates and metabisulfites. So, you know, I mean, yeah, it's, those are the things that come up most often. Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's a lot of people that say that, you know, oh, I'm sensitive to the sulfates. And it's like, you know, the, the science on that says that that's fairly rare. Mm-hmm. Now, I know there are people who, you know, have that. I've got friends who I've seen the reaction, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I've seen what happens. But I also know that a lot of it, it's kind of like a, a gluten reaction. A lot of people think they have it, but they really don't. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and that's sad because it, it limits you. It keeps you from being, from, from doing better, at least with meat making from, you know, from making a better meat, uh, avoiding bottle bombs, oh, you yes. know, which is always a nice thing. Having had a few myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fun. It's not fun at all. Oh uh, yeah. Thank God the ones I had were in a cooler, but when they did blow up, the inside of the cooler looked like a horror movie. It was, it was terrifying. And thank God they were in a cooler. The inside of my car would have been shredded. Mm. But uh, yeah. Uh, but you know, I mean, I've, I've come downstairs to find the pool of, of dead meat laying on the floor from mm-hmm. the corks that have popped themselves and that, because I didn't use to stabilize. I mean, yeah. I just let it finish and then I bottled it, you know, now yeah. I stabilize. Yeah, I, so it's funny you mentioned the sorbate sulfite debate, uh, and I won't get the results of my test, but I've actually been putting that to the test, uh, and I did basically two gallons of mead, and I split it into four parts, and then I put sorbate in one half gallon, metabisulfite in one half gallon, and then both in one, and left it, uh, the last one is a nothing variable. Okay. And I got a panel of people, and I sent off bottles and had them taste test it without knowing which one is which and write down the results. And so I have, I'm finishing that video up pretty soon. I'm still waiting on some results, but uh, it's a very interesting test. I'll say that it was, it's fun. I did it myself. I mixed it around so I couldn't know which one is which and did it myself. And it's a, again, I don't want to spoil, but there will be a, a somewhat, a hopefully interesting video up on YouTube of that in the future. Uh, Cause I do think it's a big debacle. It's, it's one of those things that people, like I said, are scared to use anything that can be labeled as a chemical, anything that has more than seven letters in it, they get a little terrified to use. So I think that uh, hopefully easing the minds of those people might allow them to not deal with bottle bombs and to be able to use more modern techniques for brewing. Not to say that cold crashing is not a logistic or a good thing or that uh, pasteurizing is not a good thing. I just think that there are, quicker and easier methods often. Well, yeah. And I mean, for somebody who is truly allergic, pasteurizing is viable. Mm-hmm. I mean, there, there are meteries. Uh, one of the things I saw in Europe was that a lot of meteries use that method in Poland. Pasteurizing is the preferred method mm-hmm. for uh, stabilization. So, you know, I mean, this is not, I mean, it's not that it's not done. It is done, but I agree with you. You know, it's a, uh, I mean, if I can just dump the stuff in there and, <laughs> shake it up and close it dang we're done you know and that's cool um, yeah. and it's a whole lot easier than i've got to get this 12 gallons of mead processed through pasteurization is a whole nother animal oh yeah that's, uh, i don't have a pot that big so no i don't either <laughs> and you know i can the max i'll go to pasteurize yeah. is a gallon I'll, I'll do a gallon and then that's about it and, mm-hmm. but past that exactly so you know i mean yeah if i'm doing if you're doing even a five gallon batch that's that's unwieldy that's you know it's, it's it's just more stuff and and cold crashing cold crashing is great but you're basically just stunning them you know you're hitting them over the head with a hammer as soon as it warms back up they used to like woo yeah. you know? <laughs> so, so really, that's not you know it might help with clarification but i don't think it helps at all with stabilization not really yeah you'd have to you'd have to cold crash and then perfectly rack off of that the yeast and, and is... not miss a single yeasty beastie and that's mm-hmm. the thing is you can't see them. How do you know? Exactly. And they don't all fall down. I mean, that's not, that's not how it works. It doesn't, that's when it clears exactly. up, yes, theoretically, there should be no yeast in there, but it's, it's also just hard. So, um, yeah. Well, and who's got to, again, I don't have a refrigerator or uh, other cold regulated device that will hold a five gallon, six, seven mm-hmm. gallon pail. 
you know, and yeah. a lot of people don't. I know oh, there yeah. are people who have converted freezers and more power to you, but my freezer's full of meat. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not meat. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, I'm I'm lucky enough to have one of those freezers, but it's true. I don't I don't really I bought it with intent to cold crash and I was like, I'm gonna do it all the time. I don't really do it that often because I, I found that I don't need to. It's I use it yeah. for occasional choices, but most of the time I don't feel the need to. Yeah. So um now kind of going back to that, the mead myth and, and really just the uh, initial mead making strategies, I'll say. We talked about, you talked about finding out those sorbate, the chemical idea. Um, mm-hmm. What are some Aging other... Is another one. Oh, really? Yeah. Aging. What, what you... Yeah, that's been a big one. And I see this every day still. Oh, it's got to age 8, 10, 12 months. It's like, really? Uh-huh. Tell that to hundreds of commercial meteries that go from get to bottle to, to on the shelf in 60 days. Yeah. And it's amazing. You know, these are great meads. There mm-hmm. are, some of them are, are stunning meads. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not, I mean, yes, there are ones that they hold back and I've had some blow your mind ones that have been sitting in barrels for two years. That's great. Yeah. You don't have to do that. Um, and that's a big one because back in the day it was you let it ferment until it was done. Mm-hmm. Then you racked it and you forgot about it because you had to age it before it would be good. And it's like, well, A, first of all, if you have major flaws in your mead, mm-hmm. uh, age isn't going to help you. Yeah. A crappy mead now is just going <laughs> to be an old crappy mead 12 months from now. Yeah, you exactly. Know, it, it's, it's not going to be better. There are some, a few things that will age out. Mm-hmm. Over oaking is one that will drop off after a while. Over spicing is another one, mm-hmm. um, you know, because it tends to reduce over time. But, mm-hmm. um, but you know, I mean, if you've got a horribly oxidized mead, it's still going to be horribly oxidized in 12 months. Yeah. In fact, it'll be more oxidized in 12 months, you know. Just want to cut it in here real fast and say, if you're enjoying the podcast and want to support the channel feel free to check out manmademead.com. It's the one-stop shop to find recipes, brewing information, all of the YouTube series, and Amazon affiliate links that support the channel. You can simply click on the links, and when you purchase through that link, it actually, a, a part of the profit goes back to the channel and helps me continue to create content for you all. So I hope you will join me there, and thanks for listening. Back to the show. So do you find... Oh. Do you find any correlation between um, sweetness level and uh, quickness of drinking? You know what I mean? Like a really dry mead, in my opinion, I feel like does need a little more time because it's, I don't know, maybe I'm just not a super dry mead guy, but uh, I, I just wonder if there's any, any link between the two. Lots of commercial meaderies are producing more sweet meads. Do you well, think that's there's... what sells. So yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're going that route because that's what people buy. Even the people that say I prefer dry things seem to end up buying the sweeter things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen that in action when I did some, um, I did some uh, trials for a, uh, well, I was helping a friend of mine who was breaking into the local market. So I sold for him mm-hmm. at a local um, farmer's market and people would come in and go, well, I don't like anything that's sweet. And then walk out with a half case of sweet <laughs> stuff. Yeah. It, it was like, okay whatever but um i don't think a dry mead necessarily needs age the thing with a well with a dry mead is that um there's a perception thing there for one but a well-constructed one is going to be perfectly drinkable you know it's at, at, a, at a short period of time just like a sweeter mead and and part of that is uh more sugar means more places to hide your flaws in your means, you know, so it's the same with the difference between a traditional and a melamel or a mescaline or what have you. Um, I like to say that a traditional, there's no place to hide, you know, right, it's exactly. just you and the honey, you know, and it's just like, it's, mm. it's the honey in the water and there is no place to hide. You can't bury that, whatever it is off note in strawberries or something, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's just, it's just the honey. And if you get it right, it's fabulous. Yeah. If you don't, then it's not. So, um, I don't think a dry mead needs more time. I just think it needs careful construction. It needs proper handling, you so, know, to, to get it there. You kind of, um, you're talking about traditionals, which I agree are, are extremely hard. And that's one thing I realized I started trying to make a traditional, which in hindsight is 
it's not a bad thing, but it's, it's difficult. You don't know how to master the style because you're dependent on the honey and the yeast, and that's about it. Do you, um, since you've been in the mead scene for a while, is a show mead specifically, in your eyes, a mead that has nothing but honey, water, yeast, no possible additives, or can a show mead have, let's say, uh, you know, if it has sorbate in it for some reason, could that still be a show mead? Because I think there are some people subscribing to that thought that a show mead is only honey, water, yeast. I always wondered who came up with the whole show mead thing because um, as far as I can see, a show mead is just a traditional. Just call mm-hmm. it a traditional. Show mead really doesn't have any meaning in the context of the of making mead to me. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I mean, a show mead, oh, you mean a competition mead? Well, that can be anything. <laughs> yeah. You know, if, if, if that's what you're talking about is a mead that's going to, you know, mm-hmm. be shown as, in, you know, in competition, then that's any kind of mead you want to make. Right. That there's a category for, um, you know, but uh, in the original, when, and I say, I don't know who came up with that, but um, I think originally it was intended to mean honey, water, yeast. So I eat a traditional mead. Mm, okay. Cause yeah. I, I did a video recently about the different styles and kinds of meads and I'd mentioned traditional and then I put in parentheses, AKA a show mead. And I had a bunch of people down in my comments saying, well, actually a show mead is, is this honey water yeast, nothing else. It's not quite the same. It's just a traditional. And I was kind of like, well, that's what a traditional is. It's honey water yeast. I just think that they, I don't know if they were considering maybe sorbet or oaking as an extra flavor. And then like at yeah. that point, there's a lot of disparity. It's still a traditional. You can oak a traditional and it's still a traditional. Yeah. I mean, that would, that would mean, okay, if I oak a Merlot, is it a Merlot anymore? Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it, it, it's people are getting, uh, some people are getting a little too pedantic about their terminology. I see the same with the, uh, Oh, it's not mead unless it's only honey water and yeast. It's mm-hmm. like, really? Tell that to Queen Elizabeth. <laughs> yeah. Tell that to Sir Kendall Digby. Tell that to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years of recipes calling it mead that had spices, that had fruit, that had, you know, sorry, but that one doesn't hold water to me. Yes. You yeah. Know? It is, it is a mead. It's, you know, they're all mead and underneath that you have methylens, you have melamels, you have, and some of those phrases, some of those, those nomenclature, some of that nomenclature came later. You know, mm-hmm. and some of it didn't. Some of it has been passed down. But um, but mead encompasses pretty much everything you can do where honey is the primary fermentable sugar. Yeah. Well, and there's a, like you said, there's a lot of um, uh, lines people are drawing between things. For example, like for to be considered a capsicumel, I, I put out a poll the other day to see what people thought. Because some people are, are saying that if you, that any mead that has peppers thrown into it um, can be considered a cap. Cisamel. And then some people were saying, no, it has to be the primary character of the mead for it to be considered a capsicumel. So there's like this, this line. I've never seen people, that. Yeah. It, it's just an interesting, um, I don't know. We all, we all want to be right. You know, I want to, I want to label my thing as the right thing as a capsicumel. But in hindsight, you could just say this is a pineapple mead with habanero. You know what I mean? Or Chip- yeah, with habaneros, which is yummy. Yeah, although yeah. I prefer chipotles in my pineapple meats, but yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm a big fan of raspberry chipotle, pineapple chipotle. Um, uh-huh. Can you tell I like chipotle? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I, it, it frustrates me when I see people trying to set a hard line, mm-hmm. you know, like that. And there really isn't any hard line definition like that, mm-hmm. other than from a competition standpoint, you've got the BJCP categories and that's an established thing that is often used. Mm-hmm. Does that make the BJCP the end all be all? No, it's just, they're the ones with a set of, with a set of definitions that are commonly accepted. Yes. You know, mm-hmm. that doesn't mean that somebody else isn't going to come up with a better set of definitions five years from now mm-hmm. that will supersede that. We don't know. You know, it's an evolving thing. It's constantly changing. But for the moment, those definitions, those, those categories as they've defined them, give us something to hang it on. It gives us something to say, this is a melamel or this is a berry mel or this is a weird mel. 
you know, or <laughs> on, yeah. non, you know, uh, non-conforming category. Uh, I call them weird emails because they don't fit anywhere else. Right. Um, so it's not an official category, just for those of you who are wondering. Um, but yeah, I mean, it just, it gives us a place to sort of hang our hat as to what is this? I mean, is it a capsicum mill? Well, officially, by BJCP standards, mm-hmm. no, it's not. That's not a category. It falls into other, mm-hmm. um, you know, because it's not, it's not a mescaline. It's not a melomel. It's, you know, it falls into, it's not a spice. It's not a fruit and spice. So it falls into other, you know. But, you know, we have a category outside BJCP that we call capsicum mel. Mm-hmm. Nobody's ever said, and it has to have blah amount of peppers in order to be that. Yeah, I've never heard that before. I mean, right. it's just, yeah, capsicum mel to me is, it has peppers. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like the braggot debate, too. You know, it, some people are, are saying a braggot has to be 51% honey as it's fermentable sugar um and you know for it to be considered a braggot and then other people say no it just needs to have honey as a identifiable character for it to be a braggot and so there's just like you know we're we're all just grasping at straws trying to understand the same same thing and trying to label it correctly and while the bjcp stuff um I, i want to say this i feel like people just want to label things correctly so that if they were to enter it into a competition, they could throw it in that category. But you're right. There are some things that aren't in there. You know, the capsule yeah. smell is not uh, necessarily it's BJCP. Not an, it's not a category at this point in time. It may become one, but it isn't today. Uh-huh. So, you know, it's going to fall into, you know, into a different, into a different category, depending on, you know, what you're doing there. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about how you've seen the mead competition um, side change over time? Um, has there been one that's been the, that's grown the most? Like what's, what's your um, historical perception of it? Well, I mean, the one that's grown the most uh, is, um, and most meteorically is the major cup. Mm-hmm. Um, and right. that, that's sort of the, that's sort of the, the Mac daddy meat comp in terms of size. Um, and I was there, I mean, I was part of the team that put it together originally. So, um, you know, I've seen it grow over the past 11 years, 12 years now. I don't know that we have that missing 2020 that didn't exist. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> you know, exactly. so it's like 11 or 12. I'm not sure. I think it's 12 this year. Anyway. Um, but there's comps that go back. Um, there's comps that go back even longer than that. Um, the Domrus Cup, which uh, I judged at, I was, I was fortunate to be able to judge at last month, has, I think they're 26 years now. Wow, that's awesome. And it, it hasn't grown meteorically, but it's just a steady, solid competition. Mm-hmm. And, you know, with a lot of, with a lot of, um, a lot of structure and a lot of, you know, good, solid, you know, capability going on there. So it, it's, I mean, there's, and that's not the only one. There's a number of other comps that started out, they most of them, almost all of them, except for Mazer, started out as beer comps. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And so you've got Midwinter, you've got, you've got the Domrus, you've got, um, and I know there's, uh, um, I think Orpheus Cup and a bunch of other ones that are around the country that have been out there sometimes as much as 25, 30 years started out as beer comps and then as mead started mm. to pick up, they added mead as a comp, you know, as, as, a, as a category and then branched that out further as they got more and more mead. Mm. So it started out with mead and then, and then it was traditional mead and melomels and then it was traditional mm. mead, melomels and methaglims. And, you know, so they, they, it, you, you see that growth happening. Yeah. That's and, interesting. You know, and, and, and getting in there. Yeah. It- and, and as far as the mead itself, the, the, quality of the meads being submitted is worlds away from where it was when it started uh-huh. i mean like night and day it used to be it was like if you got a good one you're like got a good one <laughs> <laughs> now now it's the other way around um you know more often than not the difficulty isn't in finding a great need it's in deciding which one of these great meads is greater than the other great need so can you attribute that to anything specifically? Is it technique change? Is it the wealth of knowledge now on the internet? What, what do you think has caused that? Uh, yes. <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> Sorry. I think it's uh, growth, growth in techniques. There's more communication and sharing of information going on. Um, 
the the science has advanced. Uh, we we stopped staring at the wine at the wine people like they were evil and horrible, and started realizing that they've got you know hundreds of years of fermentation science mm -hmm. that they have perfected. And I don't care what anybody says we are using wine style fermentation period end of story there you go i mean yes are there things we do differently definitely mm -hmm. but you know the bulk of what we do is you know pretty much wine fermentation and to not utilize that knowledge which we kind of resisted for a long time was like oh those those wine people you know uh, <laughs> yeah. it was it was you know it was like you know they're mean and horrible and they look down on us like redheaded stepchildren yada 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 um, but you know, so we sort of resisted that and mm -hmm. now we've got people who are highly respected, who have a foot in both those worlds, who are mead makers that are also accomplished winemakers, um, both home and pro. And they're going, look, look at this, look at this information here. Look at what's happening. Look at what I've done, what I've seen, what I've learned, um, and what I'm bringing here that says this works. This is, you know, and these are the reasons why you want to do this. This is what it'll do for your mead, that kind of thing. So we're mm -hmm. seeing more of that and saying we got techniques coming from the beer world too. Not as much, I think, in the fermentation technique, you know, as we get from wine because there are more similarities from wine than I think there are from beer in terms of the way we ferment. Right. Um, thank God I'd hate to have to watch a boil. I hate doing that because the moment you take your eyes off it, it mm, boils over. Yeah, <laughs> there. yeah. That's Murphy's law. So it's like, you know, I looked at, Oh crap. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, been there, done that. Wasn't happy, but yeah, it, it's, I think what we're seeing is that the transfer of information and the bulk of the knowledge that's available to us has, has expanded so much mm -hmm. that, it's almost hard. It's getting harder to ignore it, mm -hmm. you know, and make bad meat. It's like right here, right, right here. <laughs> you know? Well, and the, the so, new methods of people being on the internet and the latest method being, okay, make sure you use nutrient, this nutrient, make sure you, you know, you're using blueberries. So maybe do this method. Like people have done more scientific testing with things mm -hmm. to know that this yeast pairs better generally with this fruit or stuff like that. And so it's kind of hard to miss mm -hmm. that if you're, if you're up to date, at least if you're not to say the older books aren't bad or aren't good, excuse me, but they can be well, out of date. Yeah. So well, they are definitely, I mean, you go back, if you go back and look at like the old, old books, like Morse and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they're telling you to use Irish moss. Okay. That's a beer thing. Yeah. Um, you know, Charlie Papazian, who, you know, Charlie Papazian, we're not worthy. He's an <laughs> awesome guy. He's so knowledgeable. He has done so much for craft beer. And his recipes in his book had Irish moss in them. Uh -huh. I, I know I've made the recipe <laughs> that he had in there, the bark shack ginger mead. I just wouldn't use the Irish moss anymore. But, um, you know, there was that Ken Schramm's book, an amazing piece of literature, a stunning amount of knowledge. And even Ken says some of the techniques have been superseded by better mm -hmm. techniques, by better practices. And, you know, he moves with the times too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and Ken will be the first one to tell you that. So, well, her, yeah. It, it, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. You know, it's, just, it's a moving target. You know, I mean, we're constantly expanding our knowledge and, and fine tuning, changing, updating our techniques to take advantage of new tools, new technology, new resources that allow us to continually make better meat. And I think that's what we're seeing in the comps. I mean, at Domra's Cup, the hardest thing was, oh my God, these are all amazing. How do I make, how, how, how do I call one better than the other when they're all stunning? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's become more of a problem than crap, 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 crap. This one wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because, because, you know, the rest of them were like, eh, you know, only, only so, I mean, we used to see a lot of, a lot of meads that were, that needed work, mm -hmm. you know, some of them needed a lot of work, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, 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 and it's less so now you still see those, but they're not nearly as, as common, I think, right. as they were when, when I first got involved in judging. Well, and it's funny you talked about Ken Shram. I was listening to a, a interview with him um, from a while ago and he was talking about his book some, and he said when he wrote his book, the pretty much the week he sent it off to publishing was the same week that 
the that Firm 8 came out. And so in his book, he yeah. pretty much exclusively talked about how DAP was his main thing. And of course, throwing in DAP. And yeah. um, it's kind of like one of those things, like maybe had he known Firm 8 was around or Firm 8 K, like I wonder if he would have recommended that. And that's not to say that DAP is, is bad by any means, but I, from what I'm seeing, at least in the research I'm finding, um, DAP can be included, when included at the wrong time, can be hard on the yeast. So it can be, yeah, and it and it depends on the yeast too. So mm-hmm. I mean, I know Ken. I, I know Ken. Uh, if if the book had not yet gone to press when Fermaid came out, um, I know he would have talked about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's not a question he would have talked about it uh, yeah. because he he is a huge he is a huge proponent of fermentation science and you know and and utilizing the tools and techniques that are proven that you know produce consistently good results Mm -hmm. and and so yeah he totally would have talked about it yeah i mean i I, yeah i used dap for a long time too because that's what we had (laughs) exactly well it's easy too and and it's not a bad nutrient i just think that people now that we know more science about it it's it's uh, we need to use it well. We need to know when to use it and how to add it in a way that's not going to hurt the yeast. And it's taken me, I mean, I've passed, um, I just logged mead number 150 in my book, which is really cool. But I'm also looking back going, that holy is- crap, that's 150 meads that I, I didn't apply these techniques to. You know, like I didn't really investigate the DAP protocol, let's call it, um, until 150 meads. So what if I had known earlier on that, just front loading sometimes is hard on the yeast or doing X, Y, Z is hard on the yeast. And so uh, the fact that the internet is yeah. around to help us workshop these ideas and to learn from one another has made it for me specifically, super easy and super uh, nice to get into the, the mead brewing community. Um, yeah. I, I think probably one of the best pieces of advice that I'd want to give somebody, um, you know, who is coming up, in, in, in making need is keep an open mind, mm-hmm. be willing to try the new techniques that are being put out there. Um, you know, be, be skeptical, but, but be open too. you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I've been making me 30 years and I still learn things. I still pick up new techniques. I still pick up new tools and, and I am constantly open to that. There's always somebody who has, come up with something or learned something or discovered something. And I would be a complete idiot to not listen to that, to not hear that, especially when I, if, if I know it's somebody who, you know, really makes consistently excellent meat, mm-hmm. you know, I mean, I, okay. A uh, perfect example. Um, Kevin, Kevin Meinsma is uh, been hosting. I got me live with us now for about six months. Kevin's only been making mead for four or five years. Mm -hmm. Okay. But his meads are really good. (laughs) He obviously is doing it right. So when he tells, and he's a session mead guy, he's almost, he does make wines and other things and he does make full ABV meads, but session meads are his real love. So when he talks about session meads, because I've had his meads, I Mm -hmm. listen because I'm not a big session mead maker. And that's a, that's an area I want to play with. So yeah, hell yeah, I'm gonna hear what he has to say. <laughs> yeah, Be- because obviously he's doing something right. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. So you know, it's it, it, it's you can't assume that because somebody's been doing it forever that they're the end all be all. Mm-hmm. You can't assume that because somebody's relatively new to it that they're not good at it. Mm-hmm. You know, and you have to keep that open mind because the world changes, the tools available to us change. Mm-hmm. The the resources available to us change and we're foolish mm-hmm. not to see that and utilize that where it will benefit the means that we make. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And especially, you know, like we talked about just the new, new wealth of knowledge. If you go in knowing more, more than likely you're going to create a better product. Um, mm-hmm. And, and kind of to that point, anybody who sees a recipe and you, let's say you get on YouTube and you see one of my recipes or one of any other, other mead making YouTubers, uh, recipes, the most important thing to do is, you know, of course to see what they say, but also like make it yourself and experience it and try to, uh, get a true grasp for it. And you might find that 
their recipe was not to your liking and, and change a small yeah. fact. You might throw some orange peel in it and go, Hey, actually it makes it way better than what this guy did. And that's yeah. every one of us who creates a recipe uh, for the most part has not made the perfect thing. And I, I think the perfect meat is one that you enjoy the most and you might not like everybody's recipe. So why not just go and adapt it, but try it, try making yeah. new meads when you can. Yeah. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to push the envelope because sometimes the things that you don't think will work do. Um, uh, example, actually, um, uh, anybody listening has got me live has heard about Chamberlow, my Chamberson Merlot Pima that I do as a sweet mead. And um, I made a big batch of it and I wanted to, I, I had vanilla and I wanted to play with vanilla mm -hmm. and I thought this is going to be good with vanilla. And then I thought, Ooh, Ooh, I want some spiciness in there. And I pulled two gallons off to experiment with. Uh -huh. And I decided I'm going to put cracked black pepper in there. Ah. And I was telling this, yeah, and vanilla. Okay. okay. And I'm telling Sergio at Melavino this, because he's, he's the one who took Chamberlain and uh, took it commercial, Puppies uh -huh. of the Apocalypse is my Chamberlain. Oh, cool. And um, yeah. And um, he was like, vanilla and black pepper? Color me skeptical. You know, he was very skeptical of that. Um, and, and I'm like, I, I just feel like this is going to work. You know, it just feels right in my mouth and my head. Mm -hmm. You know, it just, I don't know. It just feels right. So I did it. Oh my God. I wish I'd take it. This is a 12 gallon batch. Uh -huh. By the time all the racking was done and everything, it started out as like a 13 and a half gallon, but, but you mm -hmm. know how it is. Um, anyway, so, um, it ended up being like 12, 12 and a half gallons and I only pulled two and I'm wishing I'd pulled six. Yeah. And the next time I make this, that's totally what I'm going to, in fact, I may do the whole batch this uh -huh. way because it came out so good. And I told Sergio, and in fact, I have to send him a bottle of it. Um, and, and he's actually got a mead releasing this week that has vanilla and cracked black pepper in it. Oh, because I told him it, it went awesome. really well. Yeah. And so he was skeptical. But when I told him how well it came out and, and, you know, what it ended up being like, he was like, whoa, yeah, I never would have thought that works, but dude you know so yeah don't be afraid to try something if you think it'll work i uh you know? one of my series i like to do is, is called can it be a mead in fact I, I released a new episode today <laughs> is that like will it blend yeah it, it's <laughs> it's um it kind of a play on uh the uh good mythical morning they do a will it um you know, will it taco or whatever. And they take random things and try and make it into whatever. So I have these two wheels and then I spin okay. them and each one has different things. The first one has a bunch of fruits and various things. And the second one has spices and other stuff. And I've had, okay. I've had crazy things like, um, I have like a, uh, there's a one that's a choose to like spin twice. So I had a water, watermelon jalapeno uh -huh. cinnamon as one of my, uh, meads one time. And it was, okay. It was pretty wild. Uh, to yeah. be honest. So there's that. And then, you know, like today's episode that went out, it was pomegranate and clove. So no, that would like, work. Yeah. And, and really, I mean, for me, my brain doesn't equate some of these things to go together. Pomegranate and clove, like I, I just didn't put them in together until I was forced to do so. And what I'm finding out is there are a lot of things that work well. And there's some things that don't, of course, but there are a lot it, of things. That they, work yeah. Well. That you would, yeah, the things that you wouldn't think of. That's why I'm always telling people they need to take a look at the Flavor Bible. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, because that's where they really, they don't talk about recipes. They talk about flavors mm -hmm. and flavor profiles that work well together. And I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a, I'm a um, fly-by-night cook, I guess you'd say. <laughs> I, I, I basically I open the refrigerator and go, oh, I've got, the other day it was rice, shredded barbecue chicken, and uh, what else do I have? You know, and so I just yeah. kind of threw a bunch of crap together over leftovers mm -hmm. and it really turned out good. But, but I can, I, I don't know, I guess I can kind of imagine how the flavors will be in my head. Mm -hmm. it's, just, it, it's one of the few skills that I have. Well, well that's part of developing your palate too, though. Like you've spent years developing your palate and tasting things and you've been and, and tried nice meads, you've tried crappy meads. So you have experience yeah. doing that. Well, yes and no. I mean, a lot of it is just that I love, I love flavors. I love to cook. I'm a foodie. And, <laughs> yeah. and so I tend to think, I tend to think of things in terms of what are the tastes that go together? I mean, half the time when I'm making stuff, it's like, I'm looking through the spice rack going, no, 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 no. Yes. 
Uh-huh. And and I got all kind of weirdo spices that I pick up here and there and everywhere. And 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 I I smell them and I can tell you what I would use them in. Mm-hmm. You know what I would use them with. And and so I guess I guess may, I don't know if that's a developed palate so much as a um, a flavor memory, mm-hmm. a little bit. You know, of like kind of flavors that go together. But a lot of it ties back to food for me. Right. You know, I mean that's where that's where it originally came from because I mean I was you know, eating a long time before I was making meat. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, in, well, that, I'll say the palate thing is um, for me, just taste testing stuff and trying to understand, for example, what does clove taste like in general for one, but two, what does clove taste like as a drink? Yeah, you know, and things like that. There's just some weird stuff that I. And it'll numb considered. your mouth up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. It's, it's, um, this series itself has been very uh, eye-opening for me. I've enjoyed it quite a bit, and I've got up to – I'm working on episode eight currently, and so I've got a lot of stuff going on with it. But it's um, it's been very interesting for me, and I, and I have no doubt that your experience in making mead and trying things has definitely allowed you to kind of be more experimental. And at this yeah, point – it has. It, if you've had at this point, I'm sure if you have a bad, a bad batch, let's say, you probably have general remedies to try and – uh, troubleshoot to fix it possibly i try yeah, yeah. it doesn't always work but yeah, yeah. i i try I, I i mean i had one that was actually two batches one that um stalled and no matter what i did i couldn't get it going so i had an overly sweet um orange blossom traditional mm-hmm. so it was just like it was it was cloying it was way too and i could not get it to restart and i was like dan if i'm gonna dump this thing down the sink orange blossom honey's not cheap you know yeah. and and then I had, a, I was making a strawberry melomel and we, uh, it was making it in spring and, and, and it's not uncommon here to go from 30 to 80 mm. in one day. And we had one of those, it was like a March kind of thing. And we had one of those snap and I know the air conditioning out of the house got hot. So this thing went, took off and burned completely dry oh. in like a day. Yeah. Wow. And I was like, oh man, you know, I mean, I saved those, you know, I bought like, 50 pounds of strawberries last year and that's all of them. And I fogger, you know, uh-huh. and um, this was before back sweetening was kind of the, um, you know, was uh, just fermented dry and back sweetened because uh-huh. that's a heck of a lot easier than trying to make the yeast stop where you want them to. Exactly. Um, which is true. You know, I mean, the, the yeast generally don't listen to you and don't read the packet, but um, I, I was like, I'm, I'm, I've got these two meads and I'm going two five gallon meads. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to put them together. So, yeah. so I did, you know, I mean, I, I, I got a, I think I split it across two different other pails and mixed them 50, 50 and ended up with this lovely strawberry flavored orange blossom melomel that um, wasn't too sweet because one was dead dry and the other one was too sweet. And I could never, I can't do it again. Yeah. It was an accident. You know, I mean, they went how it went. So I just blended them in a desperate effort to not be dumping two batches of mead. Uh-huh. And it, it worked and was actually one of my more popular meads with all the people that I share with. And yeah, and it's a one off. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. it. That's it's true. That is what's tough is, like I said, yeast don't really read. And so if you try to emulate the same thing as a previous experiment, you're going to run into some issues. So, um, oh, yeah. I, I don't know. I think that um, I'm willing to experiment with things, but I definitely want to find those recipes. And like that example, I would love to have a, be able to repeat a previously a, a failure like that, but it's hard. Yeah. Some things are yeah, just a failure that turns into a wild success just on accident. You know? but, uh, yeah. 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 I think I could probably go back and get something very similar, but to do it, uh, you know, like uh, get it exactly like that would be about impossible. My uh, yeah. my dog is woke up. Dog bringing you toys. He got the he got the ball, so he's. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. But Doesn't mind you too. Nope. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Um. So, I got a couple more questions for you. Sure. Yeah, my. Shoot. Um. So I would love to know. Actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna move my dog real fast because he's he's full on awake now. Give me one moment. 
Hello, podcast listeners and watchers. If you are enjoying this podcast, check out my Patreon. It is patreon.com slash manmade mead. For two bucks a month or more, if you want to support the channel more, you can gain exclusive access and early access to all of my videos. You can also support the channel, help me create new content, and rest easy know, knowing that I am able to do more with this mead community. I hope that you enjoy this podcast and I hope you will come and support me on Patreon if you'd like even more me content. Um, okay, so I want to ask you about, uh, you have a lot of experience in different styles of me. Do you have a favorite style of me that you like to brew at this point? Or are you... Uh, oh, I hate this question. That's uh, kind of like the where do you see yourself in five years of your career <laughs> question. Um, um, oh, gosh. I, I mean, I like a lot of different styles. Braggots tend to be near the bottom of my style um stuff i i just i mean i they're okay but it's just not really my go-to um if i had to be pinned down i would say probably fruit and spice so melamethaglin yeah. kind of thing i like the way fruits and spices go together do you have a favorite combination and, of those two uh strawberry cinnamon so okay interesting i hadn't thought about Each, cinnamon yeah. and strawberry huh yeah strawberry cinnamon with rum soaked oak oh yeah that so it's very good, good. Um, and that actually comes out of my experience making cordials um mm -hmm. I, I do cordials sometimes so um that was one that that came out of a uh, cordial uh combination that i come up with uh peach ginger mm -hmm. is another I one see that, that yeah. i like yeah raspberry chipotle pineapple, pineapple chipotle uh smoked pineapple chipotle oh now are you including yeah, your um, you, do you, you include your spices in the primary generally, or do you wait for the secondary? What's your general protocol with those? I know I'm sure it differs in some regards. I but. used I used to do them in primary. I am moving to doing them post fermentation. We actually had this conversation on Got Me Live this week of not really primary, secondary versus fermentation and post fermentation because yeah. uh -huh. you know. Yeah, unless you're doing a secondary fermentation like malolactic or you know something like that. But um, so yeah, post fermentation is is now kind of where I'm bringing in, I'll bring in extra fruit then, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, actually I've got a sizer that is done right now that started out with uh, meadow foam, honey, a really amazing boche that Tracy Kufis mm -hmm. uh, sent to me. And the yeast got a little over enthusiastic and ate up a lot of the aromatics that I was trying to keep. So I'm going to be back sweetening with, both of those honeys mm -hmm. and with uh, more of the apple cider, mm -hmm. but reduced with chai spices in it. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to steep, I'm going to steep the chai spices in the cider. Okay. And, and do a reduction on the cider hmm. to concentrate that apple flavor. And I've got it split across two buckets. So I'm going to do one with the honeys, one with the reduced cider and, I may end up blending to yeah. afterwards to, to get characteristics of both, but we're going to try it both ways. And, you know, I think they'll both turn out well. It's just a question of which one I like better. Yeah. yeah. It, well, I, yeah. I asked that because I, in my experience in adding spices, I found that um, I have more, obviously more control when you put it post fermentation, like you're saying, just because mm -hmm. you can, you can pull it off whenever you want that, that yeah. fermentation process can blow off some of the spice character, but also, you're generally not going to rack out of your primary. So if you're, you have it in there and you're like, okay, this is getting too cinnamony. Like this is yeah. only cinnamon. You're kind of out of luck. You can't step back and rack it off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can't, you can't reduce it. If it gets over spice, it's not like you can reduce it. It's easier to post fermentation. You just have more control. Yeah. You know, you have more, you have more control over the flavors. Plus you don't have to worry about blow off because the fermentation is finished. Mm -hmm. So the spice you get is the spice you've got. Right. You know, you're not, you're not going to be like, well, I mean, a week from now and this gets to, you know, when this gets to one, you know, when this gets back, you know, down to dry, mm -hmm. you know, half that from, you know, half that cinnamon out of here. Right. So, you know, that's, I mean, you're still going to lose spice flavor over time, but you know, you know what you're getting then at the end. And mm -hmm. that's kind of why I've, and I've moved that way with a lot of fruits too. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put, I often, more often than not, I'll end up with fruit in both primary and post fermentation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to, to start it out with that, that flavor, that texture, that, you know, that characteristic that I'm looking for, and then to sort of bump that up a little bit 
So when you end. describe when you describe post fermentation, are you saying stabilization and then adding these things in, or are you categorizing it as a primary add fruit later? I mean, you can do it before stabilization, and I know people who do. Um, I'm leaning towards I stabilize and then I go back because because this is all for me. This is part and parcel of the the bench trial to figure out where I want it to end up. So that's part of the back sweetening. Um, any adjustments, mm -hmm. that's where the acid adjustments are going to happen, if any, uh, which is not something I do real often, but it is. And, and then it'll be where I, where I bring back additional flavors, spices, what have you. And once it's stable, then I know I could do all of these things with impunity. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't have to worry that it's going to re-ferment, that it's going to just like go, ah, you know, it's done. Now I'm tweaking. Yeah. You know, uh, I definitely, one of my, well, my recipe, I feel like I've nailed down pretty well as a, as a apple or as a sizer, excuse me. And it's a sizer mm -hmm. with cinnamon. And I actually found like what you're saying that if you stabilize and then add the apples, I'm getting a more round apple character. You're also getting a little bit of sweetness from the apple itself, mm -hmm. which of course, um, I, you know, just saves you some back sweetening in a way, yeah, but, yeah. and then, uh, it, it's just more control in that regard. And so I definitely think anytime I make that recipe, uh, I start with apple juice and, and do that as the base, but I'll come back and throw apples on top in that post fermentation yeah. process just for, for more flavor. And it works well. It's worked well each time I've done it at this point. And so, uh, it, it definitely is a, yeah, if it works, yeah, it's it, more control. That's all about for me. It's all about more control. It, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's a, back when I first started making mead, it was the mead did what the mead was going to do. You didn't have a lot of control. You were just hoping like hell at the end of it all that it tasted good, mm -hmm. you know? And, 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 and you really could, and it wasn't like we had 80 gazillion different Lalaman yeast to work with and that. I mean, brew shops didn't carry that stuff, what brew shops there were, which at the time, not many. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there was no internet. So it wasn't like I could go to Northern Brewer and, you know, get whatever I want. Right. Um, you know, so, uh, you know, you had bread yeast, you had, um one or two wine yeast and a couple of beer yeast that you get mm -hmm. your hands on and so you worked with what you had yeah and and so control was really big for those of us who were just learning this you know i won't speak for people like pete who pretty much has it it's in his blood you know i mean he <laughs> comes from a wine making family and i mean that's uh -huh. just a different whole different mindset but i'm coming to this you know clean with my experience having been helped my dad make dandelion wine when I was a kid mm -hmm. using balloons as, as airlocks mm -hmm. and, you know, yeah. So, um, it was, you know, it was different then. So now I love the fact that I, I have access to this stuff and that I can, I can, I can tweak better. You know, mm -hmm. I can get a better product than what I was able to get in those days when, that control and that, that flexibility wasn't available. Mm -hmm. So I'm loving that. I mean, I got my next two batches are going to be, um, I've got four gallons of strawberry juice that I get from Abbott farms in South mm -hmm. Carolina. And, um, and I've got four gallons of peach juice. So this is just straight up juice. Ooh. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to do the ferment on the juice. So there'll be no water in these meats. These would be water free. Mm -hmm. Um, and the, it's going to be a peach ginger and a strawberry cinnamon, like, like I mentioned. And I've already got the strawberries to bring back into post-fermentation to bring that flavor because strawberry is delicate. A lot of it's going to get add up, you know, in the ferment. And um, probably going to do meadow foam, honey. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't decided like for sure foam. yet, but that's kind of the way I'm leaning. That vanilla, vanilla and strawberry go together so well. Mm -hmm. and um might be some vanilla in that as well at the end i'm still still twiddling with that idea to see what i'm going to do and then with the peach um again i've got some peach puree that i got from because i don't have my i don't have access to a lot of peaches just now it's too early season for us but um i've got some peach puree which is going to make for a messy rack after <laughs> for a bit because puree is such a pain in the butt yeah. but it's also highly flavored so mm -hmm. Um, that'll bring back that peach. I'm going to throw a little apricot in there, the ginger, and then just kind of let it hang out until I get it where I feel I need it. And then I'll rack off all the gunk and go for it, yeah. you know, and there may, there may be some cinnamon involved in that as well. I haven't decided yet. Well, I love that. I would love to do a no water fermentation at some point. Um, 
I uh, found three or four of them. They're fun. It sounds fun. My my most recent silly venture was it snowed a bunch here, and uh, a couple probably two months ago, I, I got about two six and a half bucket gallon buckets of snow, and ended up using that as my base water. Which I mean, I did a I did a wild fermentation with that. I used wild yeast from the from blueberries that I had and the honey and it worked you know the yeast ate up about 10 percent worth of the sugars and i had residual sugar and so it was just nice. a a very um interesting thing to do but stuff like that's always fun to me i would love to do that again no water fermentation uh i just got to get all the juice like you said i'm sure it's a little bit tough to find a place where that juice is pure enough and you're not just going to walmart and buying mott's apple juice stuff like that yeah yeah I mean, this is straight up peach juice, you yeah. know, and, and if you go to their website, they, they have ones where they've added a little bit of sugar to sweeten it up a bit. Mm-hmm. And the ones where they've added nothing and it's just straight up juice. And what website is that? Uh, it's uh, abbottfarmsonline.com. Okay. But it's Ab- Abbott Farms is in South Carolina and I have to drive past them um, when I go down I-85 towards Atlanta. They're just over the border into South Carolina from North Carolina, so... Yeah. Um, I tried to stop. They have one on 95 just over the border into South Carolina, and that shop was closed up last fall, and I don't know if it was COVID or just out of season. Mm. I got to call them and find out, because I really hope it'll be open soon, because I need more juice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be using up the juice that I have, and the nice thing is, is each one is in a glass gallon jug like you got behind you, so I'm going to have eight glass gallon Ooh, jugs that I can use test batches in. Yeah. So I tend to work in, I mean, my batches tend to be five to 15 uh, because I've got seven Mm. gallon pails and I've got uh, uh, a Spidel, one of the big Spidel 15 gallon jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm probably going to get a three and a half gallon and I've got two gallon pails and I picked up at Lowe's, Uh you know. So do you give away a lot of meat then? Oh God. Yeah. Most of the meat I make gets given away. <laughs> I was going to say 15 yeah, gallon batch is big. Matter, yeah. Most of the, most of the meat I buy gets given away. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's I mean, fair. I've got, yeah, I've got several hundred bottles of meat that I've purchased over the years and it's, I would say I've drunk maybe 2% of it and mm-hmm. the whole rest of it goes with me everywhere I go. I have a case or two or four, depending on where I'm going and who I'm seeing. Yeah. And how much awesome. it's going to cost me to get it there. If I'm driving, I'll take more than if I'm flying. You know? <laughs> say, yeah, I hauled, I hauled two cases to Australia and a case and a half to Poland. Oh, you wow. Know, so that they could try these meads from American meaderies. That's awesome. And yeah, it was all kinds of fun. It was stupidly expensive, but it was mm-hmm. all kinds of fun. And mm-hmm. it was so much fun seeing how people, you know, it's different. They, they wanted to try it. And then I got to try their stuff. And I brought that home. And the stuff I got in Australia I actually took to the major cup. Uh-huh. And shared it with everybody there. That's awesome, so, man. Yeah, so it was it was really cool. I kind of felt like a meat ambassador, you know. <laughs> <laughs> People must be smiling when you're walking up. They're like, "We know we're gonna get some good stuff today." I, I always have mead. Yeah, <laughs> I never go anywhere without mead. And I try to bring when I'm going somewhere. I try to bring mead that's from outside the region. Mm-hmm. You know, so like if I was coming to Nebraska, I would bring like southeastern mead. Mm. or northwestern mead or northeastern mead you know mead from another part of the country that you might not have access to yeah no i think that's uh, that's so cool to be just to be able to um help other people try stuff because i i do think that the mead community and and uh meaderies are getting better about shipping to places but there's still a lot of uh uh exclusivity to some of these mead meteries so obviously there are big ones that well well you know like superstition is is worldwide at this point and uh we got all these people that are that are big time but there's a lot of small meteries or smaller that are making amazing stuff that might not have the same capability to ship yeah they well they don't have the volume is the problem most meteries are teeny tiny uh on the scale of you know craft beverage organizational Mm -hmm. stuff um and, you know, so most meteries are fairly small compared to, you know, like the bigger craft breweries, the wineries and so forth. And, yeah, I mean, you get onto something like a vino shipper, you know, where you're shipping to 40 states. Um, and if your stuff is really good and popular, mm-hmm. you can blow through an entire batch in a week. And I've seen it, hell, I've seen it happen in 24 hours. Yeah. You know, I mean, the Lost Cause when they did, and Lost Cause is not one of the bigger ones, but they are very popular. Mm-hmm. People like their mead. And I, I can attest to the fact that Billy and Susanna make freaking amazing meat it's really yeah. good um but you know i mean they had a they had a, a sale last fall and um it was all this it was a barrel aged thing 
Mm. And they had like three or four barrel aged meads. And um, literally the stuff was gone in five or six hours. That's crazy. Holy cow. Cause, cause you got, you know, there's people that just get in there and just like, fine. You oh know, yeah. The, you know, and there's some of them are putting limits on how many bottles you can get, which is smart. You know, if you want to see that it gets a wider distribution. Uh, yeah. I mean, if they're not making, you know, they're not making 10 barrel batches. Mm -hmm. They're making, they're making 150 gallon batches. Yeah. And that stuff goes fast. It doesn't take long to burn through that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if that's the size that Billy and Suzanne are doing, but that's, you know, you're, you're seeing a lot of meteries that are doing 60, 80, 100, 150 gallons. Mm -hmm. It doesn't take long to burn through that. Right. And, you know, it's like, it's kind of like the, um, well, any, any spirit, you know, whenever, uh, is it, um, uh, Blanche is that the name of it? There's a whiskey. I think it's called Blanche. It's I, someone's gonna be screaming right now, trying to tell me what it is. But there's one that I've heard of recently. I haven't really tried it, but every single time it's shipped to any liquor store, they only give out like two or three bottles per liquor store, and yeah. so there are people lined up at the door to get those three bottles. And it's like if you're there, you got them. If not, you got to wait six months because it's not gonna happen again. So it's like. There's some yeah. meteries that are, are getting that notoriety that like, Hey, the moment this is in store, you better get it. Cause it's going to be, this is a good one. And you know, you're not going to be able to try it unless you get it right now. So I think that's really cool. Yeah. 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 So. There's, there's a cult following to some of the meteries and some of the specific meats. A uh, perfect case in point is, uh, is a uh, uh, heart of darkness. Can trans mm -hmm. meat. Limited yeah. run, you know, um, because it's made from a state fruit. And, um, and it's an amazing need and people literally would line up like they were trying to get Jimmy Buffett tickets. I know I'm showing <laughs> my age there, but, um, you know, it was like literally people like camp out on the sidewalk overnight to, to get, so they could get a bottle of this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it was one of the highest priced meads out there on the market and, you know, and it sold out like that. I mean, just gone, That's you know? And if you weren't there, because it never goes for sale online, if you weren't there physically in front of the place, you didn't get any. Yeah, I would love, that's you know? one of those that it's like a, almost an urban legend at this point. Like, not that it doesn't exist, but like, if you can get it, you're like, holy cow, I've, I've won the lottery because uh, I finally got a bottle. And I, I'm of that camp. I'm like, man, I want to get a bottle of it. But I, <laughs> I have the right one place. bottle of it. I have one bottle. I had two, but we drank one for our 30th wedding anniversary. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Oh. But uh, yeah, I've got one bottle of it downstairs hanging out. And, yeah. And I, I'm afraid to drink it because I might mm. never get another one. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I got one last question yeah. for you and I'm curious because you've, yeah. uh, again, you've been in this world a lot. You've used a lot of yeast undoubtedly. Do you have a favorite or a few favorite strains of yeast that you uh, are your go-tos at this point, or are you just kind of run of the gambit? Um, I honestly, I mean, for the longest time, it was D47, you know, the usual suspects, but I'm branching out now. Uh, carbon, carbon was talking up QA23. So that's one that I'm playing with now. Mm -hmm. Um, I really want to play with the Kavike yeast. So those, those are lots of fun. Yeah. And I've talked to a lot of people that have used them and gotten some input from them as to what they liked and didn't like. And, um, I, you know, I'm just kind of, I'm just kind of branching out a little bit, playing around a little bit and seeing what I can do mm -hmm. and what works and doesn't work. The, the sizer, I actually ended up going with the cider yeast for that. I went down to get QA23, <laughs> which I got. And then there was like this American cider yeast and I'm going, huh, I should try that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it didn't make a bad sizer. The sizer is actually pretty good, but it burned a lot faster and harder than I thought it would. It's kind of like mm -hmm. cider version of 1118. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, it just was like, wow, you know, it just went crazy. Um, so, you know, I'm kind of going, I'm, I'm looking back at it going, well, I probably should have gone with my original yeast idea, but bygones are bygones. And I can't go back and change it. So I'm going to work with what I got and make it work. But next time I'm not mm -hmm. using, I don't dislike that yeast. It just wasn't my favorite. I don't think it was optimal Yeah. for what I was trying to do, you know, but I just got sucked into the hole, but it's a cider yeast, you know? Um, I'm seeing that more yeah, too. People yeah. are experimenting with those. It's like Kavika. I feel like it's only recently hit a uh, popularity. I, maybe it's been popular just in the underground world, but I'm seeing it more and more now. Yeah. It's, um, you know, like QA23, like you're talking about, that's one of my yeast I use quite a bit. Um, I like it quite a, mm -hmm. uh, quite a bit, but I use a lot of variety, varietals of yeast, goodness. Um, and 
I think that it's fascinating. You know, this could go like this topic could go for another hour, but it's fascinating the difference oh, easily, you can yeah. make on a brew. And again, you don't understand it until you experience it. And it's it's a little hard to experience unless you're doing A B. Uh, testing of things, but you can still get a min, uh, a tiny version of that when you are just sampling what does D47 do in a brew and what does QA23 mm -hmm. do in a brew. So that's, that's very fun and fascinating to me. It is. And you got to always remember that the yeast don't read the packets or the information sheets. Yeah. So just because it says it likes this temperature and will go between this and that, uh, you know, alcohol level, don't the yeast don't read that. Right. <laughs> they, they, that's the thing. You know. like, oh, uh, when it was supposed to stop at 12, you know, the yeast doesn't read that. So they're not mm -hmm. going to stop till they're done. Especially if they're is. fed well, you know, <laughs> it's every yeast is, uh, uh -huh. it's so yeah. different. Um, it's a, that's yeah. the science of bean making is fascinated me. And I, I love getting to, uh, dive into that more and more, but, um, I do also love that got me to such a wealth of knowledge for people like me and people who just, who want to get into meat making. And I love that you guys have been around for so long and that we can dive through your archives and find things. I've no doubt. I mean, I know for a fact, cause I've listened to your show. I've listened to the, the, your guests and seen everybody you've brought on. You guys have brought on a wealth of people who are just, I mean, I'm sitting there taking notes cause they're, they're so awesome. So I want to highly recommend anybody listening to check out Got Mead and their website. And then um, do you guys post your, your podcast to any of the podcast players? All of them pretty okay. much. I mean, we're syndicated across probably 15 or 20 now. Great. great. Uh, but yeah, yeah, we're on, we're on, um, oh God, we're on Apple, of course. Um, <laughs> we're on, we're on Google. We're on, uh, pod chaser we're on um soundcloud we're on stitcher we're on uh we're on iheart radio uh-huh you guys post so, every week oh yeah there's a whole there's a whole list on the yeah. website you can actually click straight through to them because they got to where i couldn't keep up with it anymore oh, so yeah. i just started putting them on there <laughs> now do you guys um post every week is it every two weeks what's your what's your schedule look like generally we're at every two weeks right now um we were at every week last year but keeping up with that even during the pandemic got to be tough you know mm -hmm. it just it, it's a you know it's like a the next day you got to be like all right getting ready for the next one and it was yeah. it, it was getting a little complicated so we decided to go to every other week and um actually we had one um tuesday mm -hmm. we had um uh clinton chase from uh dancing bee meadery and walker honey farms mm -hmm. so uh that was that was really good we talked a lot of bees basically we let tom we had tom reefus on and tom and clint talked a lot of bees and we listened and took notes yeah. <laughs> uh, which is cool i love it when we get somebody who's got so much to offer you know basically we just kind of sit back and let them do their thing but um yeah so we were on this week and then we'll be on two weeks from now and then every other week after that and as it turns out um i was talking to sergio at melavino and he does the Mead Made Right podcast, which mm -hmm. kind of fell off the rails over 2020 because he was, you know, doing what many of us were and just trying to keep his head above water work-wise. Mm -hmm. So um, he's bringing that back and he's going to, his will be coming out opposite weeks. So it'll oh, be okay. Got Me, then Mead Made Right, then Got Me, then Mead Made Right every other week. So um, he'll, be at, he'll be in those, you know, those off weeks for us. So that That's works awesome. out really good because there'll be a podcast every week, you know? Yeah, no, that's great. Well, awesome. I will definitely be plugging uh, the website and all of that information for Got Me down below. Uh, Vicki, this has been so much fun. I am so thankful oh, to yeah, have you I on tonight. It. This has been a lot of fun. And I, I, um, I'd love to get to chat more. I, I feel like I just scratched the surface of what I want to know about your experience. And I know I could learn a lot from you. So um, just thank you for your time. I know that you have other things you could do. You could, you could probably be editing something right now and <laughs> getting ready for your next show. <laughs> <laughs> so. I just got homework and stuff to do but honestly I mean I'm always happy to talk me with people it's you know I've been involved with it for so long and it's a big it's a big part of my life so um you know I'm always happy to talk with you 
you know, yeah. anytime on air or off, you know, so. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I will be sending people your way and uh, thanks again for your time. I appreciate it. And um, I hope that everyone who listened to this enjoyed this. Make sure you click those links down below to, to check Got Meat out and uh, support Vicky and all of her team. Um, I have no doubt that you're going to learn something and you're going to gain a lot from your experience with them. So thanks, Vicky. Thank you.